All right, but I did want to, so I want to introduce to you Ross Kibido. And so now he's uh, ministering as a Bible professor at David Wilkerson's Bible College. Which that's pretty powerful. Yeah. That's stuff. Praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Yes. Amen. And uh, just so excited to be here again. I, my wife and I were talking on the way over. Obviously, a lot of you we've, we've known for many years now. Um, but my wife and I were talking on the way over. Like, man, when was the last time we were here? Um, and it's literally been like three and a half years now uh, since we were here last. And um, but what's so cool though is that even though now we we reside in Pennsylvania now, but even though we're so far away, um, we're still hearing about all the great things that God is doing in this Amen. church, Amen. and uh, people are just talking about what God is doing here. And so I'm just so excited to be here, Matt and Danielle. I just love you guys so much. And uh, it really is such an honor to be here. I just, I just love all of you and what God is doing in this house. And um, man, Naya, your team, all of you guys, man, you just led us right into the presence of God. Man, I don't even have to preach, I feel like, this morning, right? Uh, it's just one of those meetings, man, where I'm like, hey, we could just pray and worship the whole day. Like, this is good stuff, you know? And uh, so thank God for this worship team. Can we thank God for that worship team? And praise God. God bless you guys. It's such a blessing. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 4. The Gospel of Mark, chapter number 4. Now, uh, I'm going to read just a few scriptures in the latter portion of Mark, chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. But really, the, uh, the content that we're going to deal with really spans uh, the latter portion of Mark 4 and really the entirety of Mark 5. Um, but just for the sake of time, we're going to read the end of Mark chapter 4, and then we will uh, move on from there. Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. On that day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling with water. But he, speaking of Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher or Master, do you not care that we are perishing? And Jesus awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And Jesus said unto them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Or some translations would say that they had little faith. Verse 41, And they were filled with great fear, and they said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? I want to minister to you this morning from a thought that I entitled, A Heavenly Perspective on Earthly Problems. A Heavenly Perspective on Earthly Problems. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you with all of my heart for the opportunity to be back in this place for such a time as this. God, I thank you for the work of your spirit that is so evident in this house. God, how that you are stirring the hearts of your people in this hour, in this generation, to believe you for great and for mighty things. God, I just sense that, God, in this place. And Father, I thank you for the work that you're already doing here in Father, I just pray that through this simple thought today that you would add to the work that you're already doing in this place, God. God, that you would bring encouragement to the hearts of those who are faint. God, that you would bring strength to those who are feeling weakened in spirit and in heart. God Almighty, that you would use your word, God, to revive the faith of one person in here who desperately needs to begin to believe and trust in you and what you're able to do once again. And so, Father, I thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit, God, that you'll give me today to share your word. And I'm just asking, God, that you would give every one of us in this house the ability to see, hear, and receive everything that's in your heart for us to receive. And God, when it's all said and done, as we do now, we'll be sure to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen and amen. Though being one of the synoptics, the Gospel of Mark is unique in its presentation of Jesus in a couple of ways. 
Mark's story, unlike the other gospel writers, is quick-paced and dramatic. It's uncommon as you read the Gospel of Mark for Mark to exhaust or belabor his points. He's, he's quickly moving from one point to the next all throughout his Gospel. A distinctive word in the Gospel of Mark is actually the word straightway or immediately. It's a word that appears more times in the Gospel of Mark than the rest of the New Testament combined. In other words, over and over again, we see Mark presenting the life and the story of Jesus like this. Jesus does this and immediately moves on to do that. Jesus is here and immediately, quickly, straightway, Jesus moves on and he is there. The perspective I believe that Mark wants to give his readers is that Jesus is on a very important mission. And there is nothing in this world, of this world or not of this world, that is going to distract or deter him from accomplishing this mission. And so the first way in which the Gospel of Mark is unique is that Mark moves quickly throughout the story of Jesus. The second way in which the Gospel of Mark is unique among the synoptics is that Mark focuses far more on Jesus' actions than he does his teachings. And so what Mark wants us to see as we read his gospel is not only is Jesus moving quickly from one point to the next, but Jesus is moving with intentionality. And Jesus is moving quickly and intentionally to confront as much darkness and depravity in the world as he possibly can. He's on this important, this serious mission to crush darkness in its most serious and severest form. And there is nothing that's going to get in his way or stop him from carrying out that call and that commissioning that's on his life. Yes, yes. Now, whenever we speak of darkness, whenever I say that Jesus is on a mission to crush or to vanquish darkness, when I say darkness, I'm talking about that evil in the world, that evil that has encroached upon God's holy creation, attempting to defile, disfigure, and ultimately destroy it. It's a power that has been in the world from the time of the fall until now. It's a power that was unleashed in the world because of man's rebellion and because of man's sin. And from that point forward, it has been attempting to pervade and pervert God's holy creation. It's been attempting to keep people from experiencing the life and the freedom and the joy that can only be found as one finds themselves in a true relationship with God. It's a power that has pervaded every generation even until now. And the fruit of that power at work in the world is very easy to observe, especially in our generation. Yes. This darkness, this evil, this power in the world, it was a force in the world that really until the time of Jesus was largely unchallenged and uncontested. Right, right. But I love what one commentator said. He said that Jesus' presence on earth introduced a power within the terrestrial realm that was both radically opposed to and stronger than the demonic or darkness as a whole. So I want to say that one more time. Jesus' presence on earth introduced a power within the world that was both radically opposed to and stronger than darkness as a whole. Yeah. And so what we see in Mark's presentation of Jesus is that Jesus is a man who is moving quickly and intentionally to display his displeasure with and his divine power over this darkness that has pervaded the world. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now Mark's audience, which were probably Roman Gentiles, um, they would have been very familiar with powerful and authoritarian figures. They would have been very familiar with powerful war generals or pretentious politicians, etc., etc. 
But what Mark wants his audience to see is that this man that he speaks of in the Gospel of Mark by the name of Jesus, he possesses a power and an authority unlike anyone they've ever seen, known, or heard of. This man, Jesus, has power not just to persuade people like pretentious politicians. This man has power not to just push people around like abusive or manipulative leaders. This man has power not just to plunder enemies of their, of their goods like powerful Roman war generals. No, this man, Jesus, has power over the entirety of the cosmos. Yeah. That means the entire world and everything in it. Everything in the world both above and beneath, everything in between is subject to his power and to his authority. This is what Mark wants us to see. Now, ultimately, we know that Jesus displays the zenith of his power at the cross, where he finally and fully puts an end to sin and to Satan. At the cross where he secures our salvation, where he breaks the stranglehold yes, yes. of sin and he, he opens the door to eternal life for all who will trust and believe in his name. The zenith of his power is displayed finally and fully at the cross. Yes, yes. But before we get to that climax... Before we get to the end of the story, which declares God's ultimate victory over sin and over Satan, there are all of these little stories and encounters right, right. that help to show you and I the power and the potential that Jesus' presence brought and continues to bring into our world. Yes. They are meant to inspire us to believe that what God has done through the person and work of Jesus, God can still do yes. through the person and ministry yes. of yes. Jesus Christ yes. in our world. Yes. And I want to show you. In Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through Mark 5 and 43, so in just about a chapter and a half, we see how that Jesus displays his power over every sphere of the created order. Remember I said he's not just powerful like politicians in manipulating people or war generals and plundering people of, our, of their goods. No, he, he has power over the cosmos, the entire world and everything in it. And just in a chapter and a half, Mark proves that to us. In Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, we see Jesus displaying his power over the forces of nature by calming a storm. In Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20, we see Jesus displaying his power over the spiritual and the demonic realm by delivering a demoniac who had been possessed and oppressed for a number of years. In Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 34, we see Jesus displaying his power over human illness and disease by raising uh, a woman out of her affliction that she had been bound by for over 12 years years. And then at the end of Mark chapter 5, verses 35 through 43, Jesus displays his power even over death itself by raising a little girl from the dead. Yes. Yeah. And so in just a chapter and a half, Jesus literally displays his power over every sphere of the created order. Wow. The forces of nature, yeah. the yeah. spiritual and demonic realm, yeah. human illness and disease, and then ultimately even over death Hallelujah. itself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, these stories are powerful because these, so these stories, they serve as testimonies of the fact that the presence of Jesus makes it possible for humankind to experience deliverance from darkness in its most serious and severest of forms. It, it gives us hope that even for the depraved and the deprived of our world, there is hope. It gives us hope that there is no one in any circumstance in our world that is beyond the reach of Jesus and his power. But what I also want us to see is that in every one of these stories of Jesus displaying his power in miraculous and supernatural ways, 
In every one of these stories where we, we receive testimony of the great things that Jesus can do in our lives, there is a vital reoccurring ingredient. In every one of the stories, there's something that unites them. Although they are different people receiving different miracles for different situations, there's something that unites every one of these stories, and it's that of problems. If there is no problem, there is no opportunity right. for Jesus to exercise his power, Amen. thereby revealing to us who he is. Praise Without a storm, yes. there is no display of power mm. over nature. Without a demoniac, there is no display of power over the demonic realm. Without sickness, there is no display of power over illness. And without death, there is no display of resurrection yes. power. That's right. You see, like the disciples, we often see problematic situations and circumstances yeah. as roadblocks or hindrances in our following of Jesus. Much like the disciples, when we encounter problematic, difficult situations... We say, do you not care about us? Don't you know that this thing is going to cause me to perish? This is how the disciples responded in Mark chapter 4 and 38 when Jesus brings them to a place where they are swallowed literally by a storm. Their first response is not, hey, this is an incredible moment for God to get his glory in our lives. No, their first response is Jesus don't you care about us? Like, yo, we're perishing in this boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're like the disciples. We see problems as limiting us and as limiting God from doing all that he intends to do right. in and through our lives. But the thing that I want to, want to suggest to you this morning is this. What if problems are not hindrances or roadblocks after all? What if the problems that we are presently encountering in our lives and in our generation, what if they are stepping stones in our pursuit of getting to know Jesus and his power in more vibrant and intimate ways? Yes. You see, without Jesus, problems are exactly that, the problems. But with Jesus, I believe that problems are actually opportunities. Yes. They are opportunities for us to know the power and the presence of God in ways previously unknown. Yes. Yes. Think of it. If there was no Mark 437 and a great windstorm arose so that all in the boat began to be frightened because of the water that was coming into the ship. If there's no Mark 437, there's no Mark 441. Who then is this mm. that even the winds and the seas obey, obey him right. if there is no storm there is no opportunity for them to know that Jesus has the power right. to literally right. defeat nature I'll and its intentions it. itself yeah. the problem in Mark 4:37 it moved them from concept to experience, right. from on. conjecture yes. to reality. Come on. Before the storm, they and the world had a concept of Jesus. This is what we've heard and we've supposed to be true about Messiah. Right. This is what we always heard he would be like. These are the things we always read that he would do. This is what we supposed that Messiah would be like when he came. But after it, they are no longer bound merely by conjecture. After it, they have an experience what with Jesus. And so it's no longer this is what we've heard and supposed to be true about Messiah. Now it's this is what we know from experience yes. to be true yes. about Messiah and his power in the human life. Yes. You see, Jesus was fully aware of the storm that they would encounter. 
He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's fully aware even beforehand of the storm that they're going to encounter. But does he avoid the Sea of Galilee just because a storm is brewing? No. Because Jesus knows that taking them through the storm is going to provide them with an opportunity to know him in ways like they have never known him before. And what they thought was going to kill them actually becomes the means through which they know the presence and the power of God in ways like they've never dreamed or thought possible. It was Leonard Ravenhill who once said that a man with an experience of God is never at the mercy of a man with an argument about God. Yeah. Yeah. A man who knows God personally and who has allowed God to take him through the difficulties and hardships of life and prove to him his faithfulness and power. He's never at the mercy of a man who simply knows what people say about God. Yes. See, oftentimes we see problems as problems. But I'm becoming convinced that heaven sees problems a little differently than what we do. We see problems as problems, but Jesus, I believe, sees problems as opportunities. Opportunities for us and others around us to get to know him and his power in more real yes. and revelatory ways. Listen. Problems do not prevent Jesus from doing what he wants to do. Problems serve as opportunities for Jesus to put his godness on display in and through our lives. They have not and they do not problems hinder Jesus from expressing himself in the way that he desires to express himself. What I see in all of these instances in just a chapter and a half of Mark talking about the life and ministry of Jesus, what I see is that Jesus is neither afraid of nor is he overwhelmed by darkness and dysfunction like we often are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Those things, darkness, dysfunction, despair, those things actually create the conditions necessary for Jesus to do some of his greatest yes. works in the earth. We see them as problems. He sees them as opportunities. Opportunities for us to know him and his power in ways like we've never known before. So what of the darkness, of the storms of our lives? I say opportunity. What, what of a past stained by failure? Like, yo, for God, that's, that's just opportunity for him to put his godness on display, for him to put his power on display, for, for, for him to be able to show somebody what he's able to do with somebody who's been mangled and damaged by the power of sin and how that he can raise them up from death and do something incredible and spectacular through their life that could only be attributed to his power and his hand. What of a past shame yeah. by failure? Yes. Yes. It's opportunity. What of present struggles and difficulties? Hallelujah. Opportunity. Yes, yes. What of an uncertain future? I say they're opportunity. Yes. These things are a bad past, a present struggle, an uncertain future. These things have never stopped God from doing what he wants to do in the past. And they're yes. not going to stop him right now. And what's so encouraging to me as I read the life and the ministry of Jesus through all four Gospels, what's so encouraging to me is that Jesus in his grace is even willing to turn problems of our own making into opportunities for us to know his saving grace and power. That's right. yeah. I want you to think of the first story from Mark chapter 5 that I mentioned, the demoniac. You remember the story? He's so messed up in his mind. He's so ravaged by the powers of darkness that his community has literally chained him. They've chained him. They've put him in a graveyard and they've chained him literally with chains. He's so possessed and overwhelmed and ravaged by darkness 
that even when they try to tame him with chains, he breaks them off and he talks to people like a madman. The Bible literally says that he's out of his mind. And when you read commentary on that passage of scripture, most scholars will say that the demoniac is this way probably for, for, from one or two reasons. Number one, it's either because of things that he had done to himself. He, he lived and led an ungodly lifestyle, probably practicing magic and witchcraft and things like this without opportunity to know God. Or secondly, it was because of what others had done to him. Perhaps his, merit, his parents opened the doors to a darkened spiritual force that got a hold of his life from a very young age. People had manipulated and abused him. And, and because of what other people had done to him, he was in this darkened, demonic state. So either it's because of what he's done to himself or it's because of what others have done to him. But here's what I love about the story. We're not told which is the case, but what we are told is that Jesus went to great lengths to find this man in his darkness, in his despair, in his dysfunction, and set him free yes, by the yes. power Hallelujah. of God. Hallelujah. I don't know if it's because of what he did or what other people did to him, but what I do know is yes. that Jesus yes. was adamant about going to Gadara to find a man who nobody wanted to be around to say, hey, bro, I'm willing to step yes. in to your darkness and dysfunction, and I'm willing to bring the light of my presence. I don't know which it was, but I do know that the story testifies to me that Jesus is not afraid of darkness, and he's not afraid of dysfunction. He actually delights in descending into our darkness and into our dysfunction and doing God things yes, in the midst yes, of that. Yes. That's what he's been doing from the very beginning of time in Genesis chapter 1 when the Bible says that the world was in chaos. Darkness covered the face of the deep. It was dysfunctional. It was desperate. It was despairing. But then the Bible says in Genesis 1 and 2 that the Spirit of God began to hover over the face of the deep. And after the Spirit of God began to move, things began to happen. Light began to spring forth. Fruitfulness began to abound. Things, God things began yes. to happen because God, who is light and holy and sovereign, descended into darkness and he said, hey, I can do something. Yes. From the very beginning of time, he's been telling us, guys, I'm not afraid of your darkness. I'm not afraid of your dysfunction. I'm not afraid of your chaos and your disorder. Actually, if you'll just say yes to me, I'll step into your nothing and I'll make something out of it. That's what I do. That's what I do. He doesn't need the four walls of a church and a perfect worship set and a perfect prayer team and a perfect pastor. Thank God for those things. But he doesn't need all that to do the God things that he does. Just give him something that's messed up and disorderly and chaotic and dysfunctional. And he says, hey, that's enough for me to do my work. Give me that and I'm going to show you what I can do. Paul says he doesn't choose the perfect and the strong and the ones who have it all together. No, he says, hey, I delight in taking the weak and the frail and the indifferent and the people who other people have labeled as nothings and nobodies. I delight in stepping into those kind of lives and doing miraculous, supernatural things. That's what I do. We cannot, beloved, this is my heart for you this morning. We cannot get so discouraged or distracted by the darkness that pervades our lives or our generation that we fail to remember who we're with and who's with us. The failure on the disciples' part, which is often the failure on our part, is that they simply forgot who Jesus was. They forgot who was in the boat. But Jesus says, you know what, I'm going to take you here anyway. Because I know that in taking you here, you're going to yes, see yes, something right. about me that you've never <laughs> seen before. I'm not saying that we become okay with the darkness around us or that we become complacent or apathetic toward it or 
that we even become okay with sinful practice or things of this yeah. nature. It's, it's not that we settle and become okay with these things, but it's that when we are confronted with and surrounded by this, th these things, we, we, we confront them in a faith-filled fashion. Amen. We, we, we look at them as problematic and difficult and discouraging as they may be. We look at them with the attitude that says Jesus can overcome us. Jesus doesn't avoid devil, darkness, dysfunction, despair. He descends into it and he disrupts it. First John 3 and 8, for this reason was the Son of God manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Yes, right. That he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus delights into stepping into dark places and doing God things. Perspective is everything. If we don't live with a faith-filled attitude concerning Jesus and his overcoming power, we're going to live miserable, sinful lives. Yes, sir. Every problematic situation that we face is going to make us miserable. It's going to make us cynical. Right. It's going to make us discouraged and yep. depressed. Yeah. But I don't want to live there. Amen. Amen. I want to live by faith. Yes. I want to live expectant and anticipatory in every season and circumstance of my life. Do I do it perfectly? Absolutely not. And am I saying that Jesus is going to always immediately deliver us from trouble right when it comes? No. But what I do know is that even when he's not delivering us from it, he's delivering us from the, the enemy's intentions in it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. The enemy has an intention in your problem and in your struggle. Yeah, yeah. And it's to bring you to a place of faithlessness. Yes. Yeah. It's to yes. bring you to a place of despair. Yes. He never promised through the prophet Isaiah that the weapon would not be formed. But he did promise that it would not prosper. Yeah. Yeah. The weapons yeah. are formed. Yeah. They are being formed. They shall be formed. They are many. But his promise to us is that they will not succeed in their desired intention against our lives. In 2017... And some of you know this story, but for those of you who haven't heard it, I'm just going to act like there's no one here who knows the story. <laughs> 2017, my wife and I, Sarah, we moved from Baton Rouge to Central East Mississippi, where we began to pastor a church. And um, man, we went to that church with all sorts of excitement. Like we, we were just so excited, so in anticipatory concerning the things that God wanted to do in that community and in that church and for both of us like we grew up from the time we were kids teenagers feeling like there was there was a call of God in our lives to, to serve God in full-time ministry and so to have the opportunity for the first time in our lives to to pastor a church it, it just spoke to something that we had always felt in our hearts and you know you feel like it's a dream that's coming true it's it's desires that's been in you from the time you were young you know they're starting to be fulfilled and and so we went in 2017 with all of these hopes and aspirations and dreams of what God was going to do. Just a couple of months after beginning to pastor that church, my wife began to become incredibly ill. And at first we were not sure as to the condition she was dealing with. We were consulting doctors. We were driving to different places across the country trying to figure out why she was becoming so ill. And for the longest time, we couldn't figure out exactly what was going on with her. But her illness had so progressed to where by the end of 2017, begin of, beginning of 2018, she actually completely lost her ability to walk. And so just five months after beginning to pastor this church, I have two daughters who at the time are two and four years old, and I have a wife who is crippled at home. A wife who most days is so sick that she could literally hardly even lift her head off of the pillow. She would be so ill that 90% of, of the time, me and my little girls were going to church all by ourselves and she would have to stay home because of the illness that she was experiencing. And I remember in that time being so perplexed, especially at the beginning. And you know, you begin to ask yourself the question, like what good can come out of this, right? Like what, what, what can be God birthed out of a situation that is so dark and despairing and discouraging? And the fight really more than anything, even though she suffered immensely physically, the fight was mentally. 
right? That's the fight. The fight when you're in that kind of a situation is to continue to believe that God loves you, to continue to believe that God favors you, to continue to believe that God has a, a plan and a purpose for your life despite all that you're going through. But you know, about halfway through that experience, that first year and a half being so despairing and depressing, about halfway through, I, I watched as God began to speak to both of us individually. God began to speak to both of us and he began to give us promises and he began to inspire faith and hope in our hearts. And, and I remember God, it was as if God would speak to me and he would say, Ross, if you trust me, I'm going to take this problem and I'm going to use it as an opportunity to display my power in and through your life. I'm going to cause people in your future to know things about my presence and my power that they've previously not known because of what I'm going to do in and through your life. And I remember that being so hard to believe because you're in the midst of it feels like hell itself some days and there's no escape. And a thousand prayers have been prayed for you and you've been anointed with oil 500 times and yeah. a million prophetic words have been spoken to you and there's absolutely no change. And a lot of days it seems like things are just getting worse. And so how do I continue to believe that God is who he says that he is and he can continue to do the things that he's always done when it feels that I'm trapped by darkness and dysfunction? I don't know how, but some kind of way we just begin to trust and believe, God, I don't understand this. I don't see a way forward, but I believe that some kind of a way through this, you're going to be glorified. It got so bad that toward the end of 2019, we actually had to step down from pastoring that church because I realized that I could not properly pastor the church and properly care for my wife at the same time. And so we made one of the hardest decisions of my life to step down from pastoring and to move back home to Louisiana. About a year later, we felt God stirring us to go to Grantville, Pennsylvania, which is where we are now, to begin to work with the Bible school there. And uh, not long after we were there, our pastor, Pastor Carter Conlon, we were having dinner with him and his wife one night, and my wife was still very sick, and uh, there's so much more to the story, but we're sitting at dinner one night at the end of 2020, and uh, he looks across the table at us, and he says, this is going to be the year that Sarah gets out of the wheelchair. He said, 2021 is going to be the year that God raises her out of that wheelchair. And it wasn't like, hey... I've been praying that God's going to heal her. Like, you know, I've been believing God that this is going to be. No, no, no. It was God spoke to me and he told me that this year, 2021, is going to be the year that she gets out of the wheelchair. And I remember feeling so like conflicted in that moment because you want to believe good. You want to believe a good report. But at the same time, again, you're still surrounded with the issue. You feel like you're drowning in the issue. But. I don't know how we did it, but some kind of a way, both of us just said, okay, if this is God's word, we're going to believe it. We're going to run with it. And God, whatever you want to do, you just be glorified through a lot. We're going to trust you. Yes. About six months later, my wife had uh, started to see a doctor who had begun to help her some, but by the summer of 2021, she was still bound to the wheelchair, still unable to walk in her own strength. And it was in July of 2021, I'm sitting in my office and I get a phone call, it's about 10 a.m. And uh, on the other end of the line is my wife and she's sobbing uncontrollably. Now, you husbands will know that has a way of scaring you to death. Like the first thing you hear on the other end of the line. Any husbands know what I'm talking about? Like scares you to death, somebody's dead, one of the kids are really hurt, you know, somebody's in prison, like this is bad, you know? And um, oh, she's, she's crying for probably 15 seconds. And I'm like, yo, you got to tell me what's going on right now. Like, um, you got to explain. And she's the first thing she says, and you know, this inspired so much hope in me. She goes, you need to get home right now. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, like, yo, that really helps. Like, thanks, you know. I'm like, if you don't tell me what's going on, there's going to be some trouble here. Tell me what's happening. And the only thing she said were two words after that. I'm walking. Hallelujah. I'm walking. Yeah. I stood up from my desk and we live on campus and I was about 300 yards away from where we live in our home and I ran as fast as I could to my home. And for the first time in three and a half years, 
I stood in the doorway and watched as my wife, unaided, walked all around the house with her hands in the air, tears coming down her face, speaking in other tongues, and giving God praise for this miracle that had just been left in her life. Completely unaided. Completely. Some of you knew her when she was in the wheelchair, hunched over because she was so sick and so ill. But for the first time in three and a half years, I'm watching her practically run around our house. You can ask her after the service. For the first 20 minutes, I just stood in the doorway and stared at her. <laughs> because I literally couldn't even embrace her because I, I was mind blown. I was like, what's happening? I can tell you what happened. Jesus took the problem yes. and he turned it into an opportunity yes. for us to know that he has the power to heal. Yes. He gave us an opportunity to know him in ways like we had never known him before. And can I tell you that leading up to the miracle, as hard as those years were, I wouldn't trade them for anything. I wouldn't wish them on anyone, and I wouldn't go back if I had the right, chance right, to, right. but I wouldn't trade them for anything. Mm. Because those things, that season taught us things about the character and the nature and the power of Jesus that we had never known before. Oh, my God. And now, our children who are now seven and nine years old, now they can say that Jesus and his power to heal is more than just the Sunday school story. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Wow. It's wow. more than just what they've heard about yeah. in church. Yeah. Jesus is more than just a concept. Right. Our problems, as difficult as they were, provided my children with opportunity Glory. to Glory. know the power of Jesus Hallelujah. in reality. Yeah. They know. Most of their lives, all they knew was mommy in a wheelchair and mommy in a sick bed. That's how they knew mommy. But then they came home from <laughs> summer camp one day and she's Glory, walking yes, all yes, around yes, the house. Hallelujah. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Sometimes the testimony is that he delivers you from it. And other times the testimony is that he brings you through it. But either way, with Jesus, beloved, we cannot lose. We will be victorious. No matter what road he allows us to travel, our problems, if we'll allow them, will become stepping stones in our pursuit of getting to know him in more intimate and vibrant ways. And so, singers and musicians, nine, whoever, you guys can come. How does this translate to my life? You're here on Sunday morning. You're in need of hope. You're facing problems, difficulties, despairing situations of your own. How does this message of what Jesus did back then and what God's done in your life, Pastor Ross, how does that translate to my life? It's simple. We believe for the power of Jesus to be displayed Yes, in every difficult, despairing, darkened circumstance that we are presently facing. Amen. We don't get to choose how he displays his power, but we can decide to believe him yes. that he will display his power. Yes, yes. I don't know how he's going to walk you through this. Hallelujah. I don't know how he's going to deliver you from it. Absent of God giving me some sort of specific insight by the Holy Spirit, I don't know. It's not the same for everybody. Everybody's story is different. But what I do know is that Jesus desperately desires to step into our darkened, discouraging situations and prove to us that he is who he says that he is and that he's still able to do the things that he says he can do. That, I know. And I know it not just because I read it in the Bible. I know it because I've seen it in my own life. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, we were in a situation that was so bad he said, we even began to despair of life itself. Yeah. You know what that means in modern terms? It means we didn't want to live anymore. Right, right. 
it was so bad, we felt as though dying would be better than continuing to live through the hurt and the pain of our circumstance. That's what it means in English. Paul says we despaired of life itself. But then he goes on to say that God met us in that despairing, dark situation. And he began to comfort us with a comfort that only he can give. Not only did he comfort us, but ultimately he, he rescued us. And Paul says now because we have experienced the comfort and the rescue of God, now we are able to encourage others concerning the comfort and the rescue of God. Because now it's more than just what we read in the prophet Isaiah, or according to the prophet Jeremiah, or it's more than just what we read in the Pentateuch. Now it's experiential. We, we, we know that God can do this because we have been brought from death to life. We've been rescued. We've, we've witnessed him be able to comfort us in the most despairing of situations when nothing was changing, when there seemed to be no hope for the future. We sensed the presence of God with us so powerfully that we didn't give up even though we wanted to. And not only that, but then he reached down and he, he rescued us out of it. He took us out, he would say later in 2 Timothy. He rescued us from the mouth of the lion. So now that we, so now we can tell everybody of his power. We can tell everybody of what he is able to do. Beloved, maybe this is what God's doing in your life right now. You see them as problems? Perhaps, perhaps. Heaven sees them as opportunities. And God's word to you today is don't give up. God's word to you today is don't grow faint in heart and in spirit. And if you have... I'm here to revive you. I'm here to stir your heart to renewed faith and confidence and hope again. Don't live in despair. Don't live in defeat when you don't have to. Because you have a God who never despairs and never defeat, is never defeated. Father, I thank you with all of my heart, God, for how you're speaking to us through your word today. Father, I thank you that the presence of hardships do not indicate your absence. I thank you that the presence of hardships do not indicate your inactivity. And I thank you that the presence of hardships do not indicate your inability. The presence of hardships, God, they're not an indication that you are afar off or inactive or unable. God, oftentimes the presence of hardships means, God, that you're giving us an opportunity to know you in more real and revelatory ways. It means that you're giving us an opportunity to exercise our faith to a degree that it brings you back into the equation and, 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 and to the degree that we begin to see you do what only you can. And so Father, today I pray that every heart in this place would be stirred to renewed confidence and hope. God, those who are grieving, God, would you comfort them, God? God, would you minister to their hearts? God, those who are dealing with difficult situations, God, wayward loved ones, God, people who they know once walked with God, but now they're nowhere near the things of the kingdom of God. Those who, whose hearts have been overcome, God, with that kind of a grief. God, would you bring healing to their hearts today? God, would you fill them with hope, God, and confidence, Lord, that you are still God and that you're still able to do the things that you have always done. My God, would you speak to the hearts of your people today, Jesus. God, would you raise up a standard in this moment against the enemy, against his lies, against his voice and his tactics. My God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you put the voices of hell to flight today in the name of Jesus. Every voice of accusation, every voice that would instill fear and anxiety and despair in the name of Jesus Christ. God Almighty, would you dispel it by the power of your Holy Spirit. God Almighty, would you do today what you've always done? Will you rescue your people, God? Will you rescue your people, Lord Jesus? God Almighty, would you bring deliverance from darkness and oppression, God? God, would you
you work a miracle in the lives of your people, God, for the sake of your name, my God, for the sake of your glory in this generation, God. Let us see your miracle working power put on display in and through our lives, in our church, in our families, in our communities. My God, would you work miracles today? Would you save the lost? Would you heal the sick? Would you raise people from depression and despair in the name of Jesus? My God, do what only you can. Jesus, revive your people, God. Stir our hearts, God, to fresh faith and excitement and confidence, God, in who you are and what you are able to do. My God, would you show us again in this generation who you are. Show our family members who you are, God. God, enough of just telling them about you. Let them see you work in power, God. Let them see your power flow in and through our lives, in our church, in this community, my God. Let there be a testimony of the power of God in this community. For your glory, my God. For your glory, my God. Stir our hearts to believe you again. Let this community be shaken by the power of God. God, let it be more than just stories that we tell. God, let it be the evidence of your power in our lives, my God. Oh, God, we need you. Lord, God, we need you. God, forgive me, God. God, even in the past couple of weeks, God, of becoming despairing over difficult situations, God, God, give us courage to believe you in this moment. Give us courage to believe that you're still who you've always been and that you're still able to do what you've always done. Darkness doesn't prevent you. Dysfunction doesn't scare you. God, you delight in stepping into it, disrupting it, putting hell to shame, and forwarding your kingdom in the darkest and most despairing of places. That's what you've always done. That's what you've always done. God, even when your people were exiled into Babylon, there you were in the midst of Babylon with them, God. They were in darkness and dysfunction. And they were prisoners because of their own sin. But still, still you had a testimony in Babylon of your ability to work miracles. A, a testimony of who you were and what you were able to do. And even in a dark, dysfunctional place, the testimony of Yahweh was put on display. God, do it again in this generation. As dark, as dysfunctional as, as dysfunctional as it's becoming, God, moved by your spirit. Help us to be a people, God, who are not overwhelmed by despair, but a people who trust you and believe you in the face of great evil and darkness. Oh, God, do it only you.